Kicking off the list at number 10, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, here we go. Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Watshaw Longfellow, Longfellow, great last name, really love that. His wife, Fanny, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that she sadly didn't survive. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is. And the fact that candles were used everywhere obviously didn't help. You're a walking ball of cotton and some of these dresses were six feet wide cages, literally, I'll get into that later on. But arsenic dresses were on a whole new level of deadly, even without the candles, this dress could already just kill you. Arsenic was used back then to get that green look. Real arsenic was used. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and ended up dying a horrible, horrible way. Her fingernails had turned green, green foam was coming out of their mouth, the whites of her eyes had turned green. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Yeah, the 1800s were a wild time. And believe me, it only gets weirder from here. Number nine, the hobble skirt. Here we go, we're gonna slowly walk like penguins for this one. Just from this 1910 headline alone, the hobble skirt sounds like a good time. The June 12 headline reads, the hobble is the latest freak in women fashion. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Doesn't that pull you in? I want one already, let's do it. Let's. French designer Paul Poré made these to free the bust while shackling the legs. Just what you need to move around on uneven stone roads back hundreds of years ago. We love it. Love the practicality of the outfit. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and is, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons like losers. Ha, what are you, walking? So they could actually walk around, you know? What a weird thing to do. These hobble skirts were worn by the, you know, the fancy and they were like, we don't walk, we're too fancy for that. We'll just stand in one place and do this a lot. And also this, I guess. I don't know what this is. These hobble skirts were so popular at the time that upper class folks sought out a new fashion trend that made them look even fancier than the rest. So they just did it for clout. And they look stupid. I'll say, they look kind of stupid. Number eight, macaroni. This one's extra cheesy. Macaroni joke, we got it. Back in the mid 1700s, aristocratic British men would wear these large wigs, and I mean large, large wigs. These things were comedically big, but what would make them so unique was the tiny little hat on top of this massive wig. Or it was a feather, a feather or a little hat. A little Monopoly sized piece hat, just right on top of this. The Yankee Doodle Rhyme mentions this macaroni, that's the macaroni they're referring to. Stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. He called it KD Mac and Cheese. These British men were inspired after traveling across Europe and it's named after macaroni like the pasta because it signifies sophistication and worldliness. Every time I eat KD I'll be like sophistication, sophisticatedication. That was the whole point of the rhyme that any average Joe can just put an old feather in their hair and then be as valuable as macaroni. You can be macaroni, guys, you can do it. Hit that thumbs up, and then we'll all be macaroni. Number seven, Shields Green. Ever since humans started wearing fabric, we've wanted and found ways to stylize and color. It's what we do. The Romans, oh, how opulent they were. They loved purple. The Egyptians, they loved blue. Folks living in the Victorian era, they loved green. To be specific, a particular shade of green. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in the lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy, Flinga Forga Borgen. That's what they do in the lab. That's what I was told. I don't know. Or make Ikea furniture. This color was used in everything. Dresses, fabric, paint. As the valley girls would say, it's totally in. The trouble is, it was comprised of a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and it actually caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. The most famous case was Napoleon Bonaparte, when he was banished to St. Helena, the walls in his house were painted with the shade of Shields Green. It might have actually contributed to him uh, him passing. He died of stomach cancer, so he passed away of stomach cancer, so it might have contributed. Number six, pestilence. This could really be any time in history, considering how many viruses have gone around in human history, but this was an issue in Victorian times. Cities were growing larger, especially with the Industrial Revolution firing on all cylinders. It must have been a crazy time to be alive. For the rich, they mostly dodged that, but not always. In the case of laundry, well, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I mean, they're wealthy, that's what they do. And sometimes would have them washed and taken by launderers who washed their clothes with the rest of the city. Being that the clothes were washed with the rest of the clothes or washed by those in poor areas, there was a lot of sickness going around at the time and well, 
they're contagious. A lot of times the illnesses would cling to fabrics and when given back to their customers could very well come down with whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun because it wasn't a lot of fun. It's kind of like the silent, the silent undoer. Not good. Yeah, gross. So you put on your dress, next thing you know you're in bed for three weeks and you croak. Number five, beetle dresses. There's been a lot of crazy dresses in history. I mean, Lady Gaga alone would be the whole list at this rate. The meat dress was insane in my opinion. Can you imagine wearing a whole meat dress? How bad that would smell after an hour in the hot California sun? Ooh, no thanks. Plus, not to mention all the other weird and wacky things celebrities have worn. It's, there's just too many to mention. I'm here all day. Well, what if I told you a dress from the past rivals some of our modern craziness? Hard to believe. There was a trend in the 19th century to sew beetle car faces right into their dresses. That's the that's the hard stuff on the bugs and the and the vertebrae and all that gross stuff. Ooh, gross things. Similar to how women of ancient Egypt would crush the colorful bugs up to make a makeup. These were sewn into the dresses to make some sort of weird, freaky, colorful embroidery. And to be fair, it looks good, but ah, I'll pass. What are you wearing tonight? I'm wearing the cockroaches I found in my basement. Oh yes. <laughs> Gross. Number four, crinoline. Crinoline is an underskirt frame made from tough horse hair to form an almost bell shaped cage that will go underneath the dress in order to give the wearer a much fuller and royal look. You've seen them before, you know, those big cages. You've seen them. Now, besides the fact that you're literally walking around in a cage, which I honestly can't think of a better metaphor for women in the 18th and 19th centuries to break free from, but there's one main issue that I cannot get over. You're going to get in the way of stuff. Just that's just how it's gonna happen. Trying to get into doorways, carriages, really anything would be difficult when you've got a lot of extra hip there. It's, it's not cool. Also, not to mention, the fabric may get caught in something, such as machinery, which, as some stories tell us, may have actually happened and could possibly have been fatal, which that's not a good way to go. There's good ways to go, that's not one of them. Talk to the chief, not it. Number three, wigs. Okay, I mentioned the macaroni look, little hat with a big wig, but wigs were such a big deal that they deserve their own point on this list. You see it so often in movies and TV, any plot that takes place in the early 17th century, it's just wigs galore. This all began when Louis XIII of France wore a wig to hide his baldness. Yeah, people love copying royalty. Even when Queen Elizabeth's teeth were black and rotten from eating so many sweets, people copied that look. They made their teeth look rotten because, well, obviously, that's the cool thing. Gross, don't do that. Brush your teeth. In the 17th century, syphilis was also to blame. This was a bad time in Europe, of course, long before antibiotics, most things were pretty bad. But the side effects of syphilis include sores and hair loss. What better way to hide the fact that you're losing a bit of hair than to wear a wig nine times as noticeable in public than if you were just to have patchy hair? This is a solution, I guess. It kicked off with Louis XIV at just age 17. He hired 50 wig makers. His cousin, Charles II, he was going gray around the same time, so he too wore a wig, and then everyone thought wigs were cool, and then Bob's your uncle. I'm starting to go gray already. Next time you see me, I'll be wearing a 17th century lice-filled, flammable, stinky wig, because that's better, apparently. Number two, bombasting. The origin of stuffing your bra, let's do it. Mr. Boombastic, is it fantastic after all? What does it even mean to call somebody Boombastic? What is this? Well, back in the 16th century, if you looked like a literal couch, you were considered royalty. The bigger the belly, the bigger the arms, the bigger the everything, the better. Size mattered a lot back then. Men and women would stuff cotton, wool, or sawdust, yeah, they would stuff sawdust in their clothing to appear more muscular, or to seem like they ate a lot. Now it's so funny because while of course this makes sense in history and stuff like I just mentioned, the legs of these guys were always so hmm, tiny. They would more often than not make their arms look ripped and their bellies huge, but they still needed to move around and be like, ah oh, yes, and like, you know, that whole my lady stuff. A guy the size of a minivan isn't intimidating. It looks more uncomfortable than anything. And in case you're wondering, yes, men would usually stuff just one part of their trousers. That's just false advertising, my friend. And finally, number one, bustles. All that junk inside your trunk, what are you going to do with it? Saving my personal favorite for last, of course, bustles were a fun little mix of everything on this list. This was also known as the Grecian Bend. It came to town in the 1870s. Now remember how we'd wear cage dresses that extended six feet and was just non-practical in any way? Well, they modified that so it was basically just your behind that was poofed out. This fabric was draped behind the butt. That was the, uh-uh. The fabric was usually draped behind the butt, that was the original style, but some people got smart and began stuffing the back just to make it, you know, a little higher, a little bit bigger, a little more, hmm, a little more, hmm, to it. And then eventually, you look like an absolute dump truck. So some eyes were facing you, which was a bonus back then. The bustle, looking back at it, 
pun intended, is ridiculous. This was not comfortable or practical at all. It began as a small piece of fabric that would hold the dress up, and then it became this. Whenever I see this style, I always think of Aunt Fanny from the movie Robots. That movie is criminally underrated. I'm gonna end on that thought. Go watch Robots. And coming in at number 10, stiff collars. This early 1900s invention was accidental by nature, but seems absolutely painful just hearing about it. The detachable collar or stiff collar, created by Hannah Montague in New York in 1827, has been coined the father killer. <gasps> but why? Well, this stiff detachable collar is so stiff that men could die from just wearing it. Yeah, basically just rubbing your jugular up against it all day would restrict oxygen to the brain. You could pass out or even die. This man was killed by a collar! So basically your own collar is rear naked choking the shit out of you all day. I thought the tie was the worst part. Made out of usually a separate material to the shirt pinned onto, the removable, starched to absolute hell and back collar basically turns as a sharp and rigid on your neck as a knife. Pain is beauty, darling. Apparently men would fall asleep after a couple of drinks or succumb to a cat nap and sometimes not even wake up at all. Dressed to death. Literally. Number nine, mini bowler hats. Ah yes, are you tired of bowler hats fitting on your head properly? Are you stuck in the 1940s and you're now tired of regular sized, properly fitting bowler hats? Well, fear not, old heads. Introducing mini bowler hats. Yep, that right there, that right there is fashion, right there, folks. Take something that's already working and then just jazz it up. You know, just mess it up just a little bit. This look didn't last too long because only a few could pull it off, obviously. The hat wouldn't fit on your head. That was the whole point. A hat that isn't supposed to fit. It was always sideways and like dainty. It was kind of half off. Any swift breeze comes along, good game. The hat's gone. Now you're chasing a mini bowler hat down the road like it's a silent film. Whoa, <laughs> oops, sorry, my hat. Harper's Bazaar deemed the mini bowler hat one of the worst of the 1940s. Yeah, I see a lot of hats now that aren't on all the way. Drives me nuts. I just wanna, just wanna put it on. It's always like about to flap off. I'm like, you're gonna lose it, man. The wind's gonna come, you're gonna lose that hat. It's a nice hat. Number eight, bad teeth. If you've had a couple root canals like me and enjoy the taste and feel of your tongue ripped to shreds after a big old bag of sours, well, then this one's for you. Opposed to the nice, clean, white smile we all strive for today, back then the sight of bad teeth was actually, well, charming. It usually meant you had a lot of money. Ah, oh, those disgusting peasants and their hygiene. <laughs> teeth have a lifespan on their own, and the white discoloration from poor hygiene happens to all of us on its own. But the best method and the fastest method to ensure that those little chompers become stinky and brown, sugar. Which, if you were living anywhere between the 12th and 19th century, was very expensive and really hard to come by. So why the fashion craze? Well, it's got multiple purposes. For instance, in Southeast Asian cultures, blackening one's teeth or the Japanese oha guro was seen as both a beauty standard and a tooth preserver. This process would happen by coating the teeth in a mixture of goop, usually made out of iron, vinegar, and vegetable tannin to dye the teeth black. Queen Elizabeth is a great example of this beauty standard. She would basically just smash a sugar goop into her mouth every day to purposely destroy her teeth. The more infected and discolored the teeth, the better. Ew. Number six, paper dresses. Okay, we're not getting better at all. Moving on to some modern fashion trends, this short-lived fad was introduced in the 1960s. Paper dresses. Yes, it's as ridiculous as it sounds. Paper dresses to go-go. Just don't spill anything at all or make any sudden movements and you're good. You ever played Paper Mario? You're basically cosplaying Paper Mario. The Scott Paper Company made these, not expecting the reaction that it got. It caught on quick, of course. Fidget spinners were only four years ago, so if you wanna talk about paper dresses, open that cupboard and check yourself before you wreck yourself. It only took six months for this casual paper company to start selling more than half a million paper dresses. They couldn't even keep up with this work. It went so well that other companies hopped on board and they too began making these paper dresses. It was just everywhere. Over $3 million were spent on this fad. Andy Warhol was even in on the mix at one point. It was a big deal. They weren't made of flimsy printer paper either. It wasn't as bad as I'm making it sound, but it certainly wasn't good either. The dress was made of a disposable material called DuraWeave. Believe it or not, slightly water and slightly fire resistant. Unlike those puffy middle-aged dresses, it was a bit better. It's been compared to the thick paper bit that you get when you're at the dentist, that flimsy material that bunches up and then pokes your neck, has like the weird chain that's not really connected too well, that tiny little clip thing. It's made of that, a whole dress made of that. Have fun at prom, don't light on fire. Number five, wax cones. 
This next one we need to bring back. I'm tired of washing my beanie. It smells, you don't wanna know, honestly. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. We're going way back for this one. They would sit on top of your head, and back in 2019, we actually found evidence that they were in fact used. Before then, we just saw them on paintings and such. What would happen is men and women would wear this cone, and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone, and the cone itself was made of oils, fats, resins, and it would be placed on their wig or directly on their head to make them smell better as the day went by. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. Number four, crack hose. Today's footwear is pretty comfortable. We have shoes that correct your stride while you take your morning jog. We have Crocs, which, you know, they're just a blessing, you know, just in general, they're great. Crack hose were a style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century in Europe. The thing with these long-toed shoes, they first appeared in the 12th century and they would come and go over time as most fashion trends do. But the Krakow, this thing was twice as long as your foot. People are tripping over these things left, right, and center. They look ridiculous. Why were they so long? Why did they keep coming back over and over? Named after the city, of course, that they were made in, Krakows were used by both men and women, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the cooler the dude. Yeah, size did matter. These things would be stuffed with horsehair or moss, but the insane part is, is that these things were so long, a string would have to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee, so it was like, you know, had to have the cool curve. You had to have that interesting curve. We need to bring these back immediately. Imagine tying a Krakow to your knee before prom. You'd be fired up. You'd be doing like the sea walk in no time. Number three, hammer pants. Okay, look, Kyle and I were on a dance team or two growing up, we get it. Baggy pants, extra zippers, zippers that don't even have pockets, pockets that are far too shallow to hold even that of a chapstick. We get it, okay? We love a good pair of dance pants. The hammer pants from the 90s, I don't think that was it. We should have heeded MC Hammer's warning and not touched it, you know what I mean? The man turned 60 this year, so we have to now look back on the truth from him. MC Hammer himself has made it very clear. He says, quote, don't call them parachute pants. I detest the term, end quote. Yeah, man of few words, but you know what? When you sing that many songs, you don't need to speak anymore. Obviously, MC Hammer didn't invent this style, but it's funny to see him act like he did. You know what I mean? These types of trousers initially appeared in Persia, India, and Turkey thousands of years ago, but we love your bangers, MC Hammer. All three. Number two, Belladonna Drops. Growing up with bad vision, I've had some pretty weird things shoved into my eyes. Dirty fingers, drops, but never a scoop of buried jam. No, I kind of missed out on that one, I guess. Okay, maybe not jam, but the belladonna berries, though very toxic, had an unusual role in beauty standards in medieval Europe. Upon squishing this doughy-eyed remedy into your sockets, the persons, usually women's eyes, would dilate, resulting in huge, doughy puppy dog eyes, just running around town with blurred vision like you're about to get ophthalmologisted. E, M, L, four, nine, strawberry, raspberry, blueberry, that's not, okay, what, what? Of course, you wouldn't be able to see how good you look, per se, as if you've ever been dilated for optometrist reasons, then you know exactly what I mean. The belladonna or beautiful woman drops got you running into walls every two seconds, but boy oh boy does she look beautiful. Number nine, raising the skirt line. If you're Amish, best look away now. Yes, well, the previous decade saw a mass flourish in the extravagance of the dress. The increased mobility thing I mentioned earlier meant that women more than likely found themselves a little sick of tripping over their clothes. As a result, the skirt line began to lift, and the overall ensemble of skirt and underskirt was dropped in favor of just simplification. While normally this would have been met with outrage, the interesting component lies in how these trends were framed. See, these women weren't just being scandalous, they were being patriotic and practical. In wartime, this distinction was wide enough that the usual voices were uncommonly silent. This could also be attributed with the rumblings of the dance craze, the sudden need to go out and move requiring clothes that, you know, didn't eat your feet. Number eight, big ol' hats for the ladies. Where the 1900s saw hats growing upwards, the 1910s saw hats growing outwards. These new hats had unusually wide brims and were designed in a way that allowed them to rest on the skull at a tilt. At the same time, short hair was was becoming just as popular thanks to one Irene Castle. And as a result, both trends neatly intersected and ended up accommodating each other quite nicely. Some of these designs ranged from 
simple and neat to just outright bizarre. It's like there was a competition to stuff the top of the head with as much feathers, bells, and whistles as they could. As a result, these strange hats have become deeply iconic as a part of women's fashion for the time. And while they did eventually get reined back in, there are some absolutely banana designs that you would even think would make Napoleon blush. Number 7. Propeller hats. Okay, I'm coming for hats in this video, it seems. Sorry about that. Propeller hats in Super Mario, very practical. A lot of Goombas, sudden gusts of wind, plus a few warp pipes. You're gonna need a lift or two, right? Fair. The summer of 1947, not that windy. Not that windy, folks. Not windy enough for propeller hats. I'll tell you that for free. Why are teens in the 40s wearing airport runway anemone eaters on their heads? Why, we don't need to know the wind velocity outside. Just go eat some ice cream. Well, it started with a cartoonist named Ray Faraday Nelson. See, he used this propeller hat in a cartoon, and then later on at a sci-fi convention, he had the cartoon there with a real-life propeller hat. And everyone was like, what, how? How did he just do that? This of course swept the nation just like the fidget spinner. Brands made their own versions, they hopped on the trend quickly. So quick in fact that Nelson never had time to even secure a patent for this new fresh idea. Yeah, it was too late. He didn't get a dime from the hats and we didn't get the gift of solo flight. So, let's call it even, right? Number six, ruffs. With silken coats and caps and golden rings, with ruffs and cuffs and farthingales and things. Taming of the Shrew, Act 4, Scene 3. Ah yes, the theater and the rough. Well, not that rough, but quite literally theater in a rough. A rough, I sound like a dog. A rough, or also known as the Elizabethan collar, was an interchangeable piece of cloth that could itself be laundered separately while keeping the wearer's gown from not being soiled at the neckline. Long story short, no Chef Boyardee spilling out of your mouth and down onto your clothes. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. The stiffness of the garment forced upright posture and poise. Most ruffs could only be worn once due to its longevity and structure. Made out of a very fine material like silk, their light and delicate material, design and size led them to become a symbol of wealth and status amongst the upper class. There was even a time where blue dyed ruffs were against the law in England since it resembled Scotland's colours on its flag. It shall only be of two primary colours, yellow and blood. Oh, red. Red? Red! Number 5. Smoke Break Jackets. Here we go. Hey, remember Hugh Hefner? Yeah, not only did he treat women like sh but he also dressed like it completely. Yeah, rather fitting if you ask me. Guy would wear a stinky maroon coloured jacket and then sit there and blow smoke in your face all night. What an icon. Guy changed history. He would wear what's called a smoking jacket. That's what he was... That's what this garbage is. They were around in the 1600s, but they really peaked popularity in the 1920s, when Hugh was like 56 years old, you know what I mean? These jackets were designed for gentlemen, I mean obviously, you know. You know, they were designed as bathrobes with class. They were made of this velvet cloth, perfect for soaking up cigar smoke and further accusations. God rest his soul. He really left his mark in history, didn't he? Number 3. Flora Sands Not so much a trend, just more of an interesting observation. As women's fashion began to grow more masculine, the change in fashion made masculine clothes more desirable as a result. Coinciding with this was the military career of Flora Sands, who served in the Royal Serbian Army during World War I. As women weren't particularly common in the army, she was actually the first one, she struggled to make her way to the front, eager to join the fighting in lieu of working as a nurse. Finally enrolled as a private, she worked her way up in the military, becoming a captain. Now, interestingly enough, while attending a royal event of some sort, a member of the royal family was quoted as observing Sands and stating that she wished she could wear clothes like hers. Number two, radium hair tonic. I wish I was joking. One of the downsides of haphazardly clinging to the ideas of progress as an all encompassing good can be found in the world's slow realization of the precise dangers of radioactive materials. Prior to this, workers were made to handle radioactive materials with their bare hands, most famously the radium clock painters. While not dangerous to the customer, prolonged exposure of the mostly female work staff led to extreme illness and in most cases death. But before that horror story came to light, some dude actually tried to sell this as a hair tonic. Seriously, make your hair glow for five dollars. How many people actually bought this product was unknown, but it is clear that after the effects 
of the clocks were made public, the product was subtly pulled from shelves. Number 10, corsets. Hey, what's more lethal than being constricted by a garment that it really is unnecessary unless well, unless you really need some support for the chest. I'm sure most ladies are familiar with what a corset is simply because I too would be afraid of them. They're not they're not fun. Nobody likes being squeezed or choke slammed like one of the Undertaker's victims. Oof, no thanks. That guy's scary. The corset was a garment that went under the dress to help squish together everything. Tummy, chest, all into the desired look. Trouble is, well, they're tight, they're not comfy, and well, they can actually cause a lot of health issues, especially in warmer climates. Breathing becomes an issue and women have been known to faint. While not a dress itself, yes, I know, but for hundreds of years, it did go with every dress. So I say that counts because you couldn't wear a dress without one. Number nine, muslin disease. This one is just crazy, man. Okay, let's take a look back at the 18th and 19th century France, where there was a law against the peasant class wearing more than four kilograms in weight of clothing. Ooh, what? Thus preventing the lower class from owning higher quality fabrics that were strictly reserved for the rich and wealthy. Ooh, that's scandalous. So, a lot of times, women would disregard their undergarments, which that is crazy enough alone. However, what's really crazy is that they would wear muslin dresses, which which were often dampened with water before going out to have a light, breezy, and cool outfit to wear in the summer. Plus, it was kind of see-through, so you could kind of see all the, the curves in all the right places. The trouble is, sometimes these light fabrics were wetted down and worn in less than prime weather conditions, and some people, well, they got really sick. It was actually suspected to be the reason for the 1803 influenza outbreak in Paris. Was it? Maybe, did it contribute? Probably, but not the main reason. Still though, that's crazy. Number seven, big foreheads. Here we go, this one's for the ladies. Nice, hit that thumbs up for this big old forehead, this bright forehead. You can see the lights off. If I stand here, that's the forehead light right here. Elizabethan foreheads, yes. Here's one I could finally lean into. My family called me a five head growing up. Little did they know I would have cleaned up shop back in the 1600s. Here we go. Plucking your hairline was a sign of beauty back in the day. How amazing is that? I mean, it still is today, but it's different, right? We're kind of pulling back. We're like, you know what? No, I don't want to pluck anything anymore. It hurts, I'm done. More often than not, women in the Renaissance era wore restrictive upper body clothing. The ideal look back then was flat chested and hair plucked back, like you're a goddamn chicken. I can't even pluck this unibrow thing that I have going on here. I just shave it, I give up. Plucking hurts. I'm just gonna shave this one spot for the rest of my life. So mad respect to the pluckers out there. Pain is beauty, I guess. Ice road pluckers. Number six, cowboy hats. Well, howdy, partner. <laughs> Made most popular by horse riders, farmers, and your buddy named Dougie, the cowboy hat or cavalry hat has been around for quite a long time. First started with the Mongolian riders and then taken on new shapes and forms throughout history as the wide-brimmed hat. The cowboy hat is back and popularized in southern states around the early 1800s. Made out of literally any material from straw to felt, this large crown, large brimmed hat kept the sun out of your face and off your body. Hey, sun safety. It resembles the sombrero from the early Mexican youth and influence, these things have been around for centuries and are still thriving. I mean, just go to any Kenny Chesney concert, you'll find about 100 on the ground after the concert. Just pick one up, put it on your head, free. Some have strings, some have feathers. The cowboy hat has made its place in fashion and practically yeehaw and forever. That's a terrible joke. Number five, bliats. Heading back to the 12th century for this gem. European men and women both rock this look, okay? Of course, sleeves that droop down all the way to the floor. Who wouldn't want a piece of that action? Walking around all slow like this for no reason? We've seen Lord of the Rings. Imagine walking around in a castle with one of these playfully just dragging behind you as you emerge from the cellar on a full moon night. Oh, my majesty. I'm gonna faint thinking about it. That's easy. Man, we need bliats back today. I wish I had a couple bliats for prom. I wouldn't have even had to ask her to dance. I would just stick my bliats out and then a queen would accompany me. Just like that, voila. The roots for this dazzling look go back to the French Germanic origins. The word translates to our modern day use of blouse because it was the same light ghosty material. Yeah, imagine attending a meeting in a bliat blouse made of silk. Immediate write up, so fast. Number four, the bikini. I don't know why, but for some reason in every picture as a kid, I'm running around in a sexy black speedo. <laughs> You know the deal. No shorts, just thong on cheeks. I was always embarrassed by the lack of clothing and felt vulnerable, but learned growing up that that's fashion, baby. Sometimes you feel a little uncomfortable. The bikini, a controversial and even at many times illegal 
piece of clothing is a piece of fashion that has been around as early as 5600 BC. And the history of the bikini can be traced back to that era. Carvings and paintings of women wearing bikini-like garments during the competitive athletic events in Rome have been found in several locations. Most of the time worn by women, the bikini went through a ton of design. Two-piece bathing suits have been seen all over the world. So what's the problem? Well, it's illegal in certain places and illegal now, still. Inappropriate use of showing off one's body could be a crime around the early 1900s. Police would just walk around the beach and measure the length of a two-piece bathing suit. <laughs> You have the right to remain silent, anything you do or say. The 30s and the 40s, it's still pretty exotic and people were kind of shady about the idea of revealing so much skin. The 40s and the 50s comes around, starts to become a little bit more Hollywoodized, and then the 60s and 70s, it's on every magazine in America. The two-piece bikini is worn today and is a symbol of confidence and sexuality. How much do you think they go for? Number three, Annalene Dye. The year was 1856 and life was great, or not so great depending on who you ask. If you ask a rich guy, it was probably good. A poor guy Probably not. There was lots of illnesses to be had and lots of folks had siblings who perished young from being ill. Everyone's got a story like, ah, my sister, right, she never made it, but she never made it. She's not here anymore. Anyway, William Henry Perkin was a man on a mission to cure as many illnesses as he could. Many Imperial soldiers were feeling a lot of those illnesses at the time, specifically malaria. He was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. Hmm. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye. So. Task failed successfully, I guess. It was a dye that makes deep reds, purples, and even black. Ooh, naturally, this picked up a lot of steam. Or roll, paint roller, I guess, because dye, funny color. Ha, <laughs> good joke. Anyway, and it began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. The trouble is, once people got enough exposure to clothing with aniline dye, their skin would go red, itchy, and severely inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb through their skin and their bloodstream and poison their blood. Blood. That's bad. That's not good. We don't like that here. Sure, there's bad outfits out there, but blood poisoning? Yeesh. Ugh, no thanks. Number two, cellulose nitrate. You take some nitric acid, you take some sulfuric acid, you mix it together and run it through some flammable material or a medium such as cotton, and bada bing, bada boom, literally, you got yourself some cellulose nitrate. The process was commonly done on clothes back in the late 19th century, which is just an awful idea. Some people People might think it's because you're wearing volatile compounds, which is very true. That, that's very true. But imagine a warehouse full of garments treated with this stuff. Uh-oh, not good, especially considering how unstable it is. Chemistry fans will agree with me when I say while it's different, it's actually very similar to nitroglycerin, which was used to detonate large rocks and pathways when the railroads were being built across the nations. Canada and the US, of course, I'm talking about. It wasn't good. A lot of people got hurt in that one. It wasn't good. Number one, the revenge dress. We've talked about a lot of naughty stuff on this list and on this channel, so it's time for some levity. What What's the deadliest dress out there? Well, that would have to be Princess Diana's revenge dress. Ooh. Worn by Princess Diana after her husband, Prince Charles, publicly admitted to an affair. What? Scandalous. Which, for royals, is a big no-no. You kind of can't really do anything without the media noticing. This dress is also lethal because, well, there's a good chance Diana maybe sort of kind of was done in by the royal family a couple years after she wore the dress. It, was, it wasn't too long after that. Plus, if it's called the revenge dress, I mean, come on, she was out for revenge. She was out for the out for the blood. That counts, sure. A little bit of fun. And number 10, leather jackets. I just had to say that cool. I felt like I needed to. Okay, so how did we get from prehistoric leather to grease lightning? This warm, durable piece of clothing has been popular for many eras, but now. Where did it all start? Well, firstly, on the animal. The leather jacket we're used to seeing is based off the World War I jackets. That's right, German pilots wore these brown, thick leather jackets in their planes before the cooler, sleeker bomber jacket was born. From the early 1900s, we see the leather jacket really start to take off with more military use in World War II, now worn by all sides. Irvin Schott's initial design was created in 1928 and widely used by military motorcycle personnel. He named the first one the Perfecto after his favorite cigar company. It wasn't until the 1950s and 60s where we see this garment take on a sense of actual fashion with studs like McQueen and Brando repping the look in Hollywood movies and well, there it took off. Punks in the 70s and 80s, women, men, these are all everywhere now. Of course, the faux leather has also made its way into life now with the abuse and cruelty of animals. I'm all here for it, not judging. And it comes in literally every size and color and you can literally buy a leather jacket anywhere you go. Number nine, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters changed the world as we know it. 
Right on. I love both of those things still so much for sure. See, not all inventions in 1933 were family friendly. Some of them were quite deadly. Like the one of a kind mascara, lash lure. Here we go, it'll lure you right in, easy peasy. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical called p phenylidamine I can't even say it, that's how you know it's bad, right? This mascara left blisters all over your face. It wasn't working, the chemicals didn't react properly for some cases, and it was horrible. Now, eventually, in 1933, there was sadly a death. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and ultimately passed away because of said mascara. That same year, the before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. Yeah, it was a horrible incident, but it got the attention from higher ups. Lash Lure was the first product in history that was ever removed from stores. There's a little dark fun fact for you. I guess the display at the old Chamber of Horrors did the trick. Lord. We're in the middle of something similar now though, aren't we? Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking images right there on the package, you know? The chick on the cover looks like a demigorgon from Stranger Things. You're like, Ugh, I'm all set. I'm just gonna fidget spin this. That's horrible. Number eight, sunglasses. This bright invention was first created in the 12th century China. This rough, heavy slab of carved quartz was first used in an attempt to block the sun's powerful rays while being able to protect the face and eyes. These glasses didn't have ear rods and were just held up against the face. The Inuit of North Canada have something like this as well, made out of bone or a piece of wood, carved with slits cut out of it for the eyes to see into the bright snow. The smoky glass texture of the quartz allowed the person to see through the glasses and have the rays refracted through the dark color. See, I said refracted, lots of scientific words, you know what I mean? Basically, they were just experimenting with different smoky rocks and gems in front of their face until James Oskow started making way with tinted lenses in the 18th century. The rich were wearing more and more shades until about 1939 when Ray-Ban made the aviator polarized lenses and the shades were forever changed. First pair sold for five bucks. 40 days to carve and polish for five bucks, huh? Not a bad deal. Number seven, bowler hats. For men's fashion, nothing was more indicative of the time than the bowler hat. While it was originally created in the 1840s, these hats rose to prominence against stiff competition from the top hats, which we all knew were fighting an up hat battle. Fedoras were still, fortunately, a ways away from becoming the saddest thing to grace the human eye, and so the bowler hat found a nice little niche for itself to rule quite comfortably from. A symbol of the city man, the bowler hat became synonymous with both the time period and the working man, and has remained something of a time-stamped staple ever since. Like, come on, you've seen Charlie Chaplin, the dude was born in a bowler hat. Number six, makeup trends. At the turn of the century, makeup was just beginning to become a little bit more accepted culturally, which led to a slow increase in its modern application. In particular, paleness had become something of the accepted norm, which women would attempt to achieve through the consumption of lemon juice or, you know, just the direct application of it to the face, probably in the eyes. The idea of appearing youthful was gaining major traction, and demands were met with an increase in beauty salons, but over-application was still harshly criticized. Number five, morning clothes. In wartime, it was common to suddenly learn of the passing of a family member or relative, and with funds strained, the process of going through the morning ritual became more streamlined. Well, general rules did determine the length of mourning depending on the closeness of relations, ranging from several weeks to half a year. The actual rules of propriety regarding clothes worn was quite simple. It's gotta be black. As a result of this, it became commonplace to just simply dye everyday clothes black in place of breaking the bank on new morning clothes, as it was likely to experience more than one or two deaths a year. Number four, the straightening of dresses. As fashion moved onward, the common shape of the dress was actively reconsidered. Orientalism, their words, not mine, became the center of focus for a number of styles. The designer Paul Poiret being credited for its implementation into Western style. While the morality of this remains to be seen, it was generally responsible for moving styles away from the outwardly flowing dresses and drawing them inwards, in direct contrast to the hats. On that topic, turbans were actually also slowly making their way into popularity alongside this, though it should be clear that the majority of these decisions were made purely with the goal of just changing the common aesthetic, with little regard given for 
the actual cultural significance of the style. Even so, the impact was clear, and what was poofy was on its way to becoming slim. Number three, moon boots. Unless you're Link from the past and or future, you're not pulling off a pair of moon boots, okay? Sorry to burst your bubble. Back in the late 60s, these hot and heavy pieces of footwear were the hottest trend in town for some reason. Yeah, winter boots all year round, we love it. Fashion. But yeah, welcome to Canada. Also, we wear these 11 months out of the year. It sucks. My ankles are always hurting. Moon boots originally appeared in 1969 in Italy, and it was part of a ski wear collection, but add a little Apollo 11 moon landing into the mix. Now we have a fashion trend in history. Now we all think we're astronauts and we're dragging our feet to the club in the middle of July. Once space became old news, so did the Apollo boots, sadly. We've seen these bad boys appear in modern history. Chanel, Jeremy Scott. Big names are still trying, trying to bring back the moon boots. Let's bring back the moon shoes. How about that? How about a functioning pair of those? Remember the commercial? Kid jumps, grabs an apple, lands. Just false advertising at its best. Number two, high heels. The high-heeled shoe or high heels or simply known as where's my heel have been a piece of fashion since the early 10th century. The design raises the heel of the wearer's foot significantly higher off the ground than the wearer's toes, causing the wearer's legs to appear longer, make the wearer appeal taller, and accentuate muscle tones in the wearer's legs. It's all about the calves nowadays, man, all about the calves. Typically seen as a men's garment until the mid 1500s, the high heel is a staple in today's fashion as its design and functionality hasn't changed in almost a thousand years. King Louis XIV of France made heels a standard and would have himself hundreds of pairs of gemstones, lavishly precious metal lined high heels, basically just one of the Kardashians closets. But as we all know, pain is beauty and these nasty things really f**k up your feet. Due to the structure of the high heel, this piece of fashion could be the most harmful to our bodies. Just shoving your size 8 in a sexy size 5 crumpled up like Play-Doh all night? Yeah, that's uh, definitely gonna do it. And finally, number one, painted veins. Hey, from one pale human being to another, I have no idea where this came from. I, I don't get it. I don't see it at all, really. Back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. There was painted or natural. See, natural was light on the makeup, as you'd guess by its name, but painted, well, they meant that in a literal sense. This more vibrant look required actual paint, just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying all this is you can't move or smile. Yeah, any emotion will cause the paint to crack. That's why all these paintings are so serious. Four more hours? Four hours? Okay. Madam X, the portrait, the famous portrait, originally painted back in 1884. At first, her straps were slipping off her shoulder, right? A little, right? But that was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around the painting at that time. So John had to repaint the straps back on. What a joke. He's like, okay, too sexy? Okay, straps are on, there we go, we're fixed. Backlash was still so strong after John had sold the painting because her skin was so pale and you could see her veins. They were like, oh, too much. I can see through you, what the hell? Just no winning back in the 1800s, eh? Can't have spaghetti straps, can't have veins. Wait till Playboy comes out. You guys are gonna shit.